This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and thank you for joining me this week for my chat with Dr. Jude Piesi. I can't remember how I came across Jude's book, The Ghost in the Garden, but it immediately interested me as a piece of writing about Charles Darwin's largely forgotten garden in Shrewsbury. The book turned out to be much more than a study of the garden, its history and the man himself. In fact, these aspects are almost incidental to the other characters in the book, and this makes it an amazing narrative where many aspects are hung together on the framework of the garden, which is actually the fate of all created gardens. They're animated by the things that pass through them. One of the things that struck me when you when I was reading the book was that you you kind of almost happened across Charles Darwin's garden. Um, and I wondered what it was about the garden that initially interested you. Yeah, so I, I kind of first came across the garden um, in 2015 when I moved to Shrewsbury. So I moved there to take up what was my first sort of lecturing job. Um, and I did grow up in Shropshire, but I didn't know about um, sort of history of this site or its presence until sort of that point when I did move back. And you're right, when I, when I moved there, I kind of, you know, I stumbled upon it. I was kind of amazed, you know, and kind of kind of thrilled to discover really that this garden was um sort of literally on my doorstep so um the house I was renting in Shrewsbury part of the old kitchen garden walls were just outside the front window of my house um so I learned about that from talking to local people and people who knew about the site and then if you kind of take a walk down by the river around the corner from this house that I used to rent then you come across these two fenced acres um of the kind of terrace bank um, which are very very steep um very overgrown and kept by Shropshire Wildlife Trust um, so I think what attracted me first of all to the site was it was that kind of sense of serendipity that sort of seemed rude to kind of, you know, not be interested in this fascinating place that I happened to be living in. But I was also really attracted to the kind of um, the sort of ambience of the place and the feel of the site. So down by the river, it's kind of very wild and it's very overgrown. So there's lots of greenery, um, sort of wildlife, um, sort of Sam Martins, your kingfisher, that kind of thing. Badgers at the moment causing a lot of trouble down there um, but not at the point um, when I was doing most of my walks so I was really attracted to what it was like I was attracted to the idea I suppose of this being a kind of secret garden or a lost garden as well so it's not you know it's not that widely known about it is known in local and specialist circles um, but it's you know it's not um, at all as well known as Down House at Kent um, and it's not open to the public generally or and it hasn't been developed for tourism so I was really interested in all of that you know what the setting was like um, the sense of secrecy and then again um, at the point I was getting to know the site I was pregnant and then I was on maternity leave so I think for me some of that sort of started to merge in creative ways um, and my own sort of experiences of raising a family and motherhood began to sort of overlap with research into the Darwin's um, family and into uh, Darwin's childhood as well. So in my book, the um, the garden becomes a kind of springboard for some sort of broader reflections on how we're all shaped by kind of family life and mothering and by sibling relationships. And that all kind of interconnects for me um, with the research that I did into the Darwin's and their garden. You wrote to me in an email that the book is more a collective biography and a memoir yeah than just yeah. the story of Darwin and that it incorporates a whole host of characters and did you intend to write the book that way when you started out yeah I did so for me um I didn't really want to write um the story of a kind of great man of science although that is an interesting story and it's a big part of the story and it's why you know it's why the site is famous in the first place so it does have that strand about Darwin and how the garden kind of shaped Darwin's life and work but I also wanted to tell the story of lots of other people who who've been connected to the site over history. Um, so his mother and his sisters and some of the gardeners who worked at the site and my own story as well. And I felt that that was a particular opportunity, really, for um, sort of thinking about how Darwin's life and work was shaped by sort of domestic influences, how it was shaped by his sort of childhood and for sort of telling the story of the garden um, and of the land and of the site as it is today. Um, as well as um, its importance to sort of Darwin's life and work. So it was something that developed for me quite early on. That I wanted this to be a different kind of um, 
sort of collective biography slash memoir also with aspects of nature writing as well that kind of um you know kind of celebrate what the site is like today Mm. yeah so so coming back to the actual physical garden and the house when were they created and and I know it's kind of not the the main point of your book but you did touch on it and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about what the contemporary horticultural world was like at the time Sure. So the garden dates back to the construction of the Mount House, which is still standing. Um, and that was between around 1798 and 1800. Um, so Darwin's father, Robert Darwin, who was a doctor um, and a kind of wealthy man, um, he purchased the plot as a home for himself and his wife, Susanna, and what was to be their sort of growing family. Um, so it was, you know, back in the day in the 1800s, it was this huge seven acre site that kind of upstaged the house and it had all of these exotic features. Um, so it had hot houses and a binary um, and extensive lawns and a, a, a large circular flower garden. Um, so some of these features are quite unusual for the day. And I think that one important feature of the horticultural world, at least the sort of elite horticultural world at the time, was that it was really opening up to the age of empire um, and the kind of fruits of em- empire. So um, plant collectors were beginning to collect plants from across the globe, and some of that was happening in very close quarters to the Darwins. Um, so Susanna Darwin's brother, um, John Wedgwood, was the um, co-founder of the forerunner of the Royal Horticultural Society in 1804. So a lot of exotic plants were available to the Mount um, that wouldn't have been available to an earlier generation. So that might have been via nurseries or it might have been via direct exchanges with some of these um, horticulturalists in the family. So lots of um, kind of rare and interesting plants were grown at the Mount. So peonies and opium poppies, azaleas, orange trees, chrysanthemums and pineapples as well. Um, so all of that was going on um, in Shropshire in the in the kind of shires, um, all of these you know, exotic kind of um, um, fruits of empire. Yeah, and that it throws up the fascinating question, which is, you know, obviously we moved from landscape gardens to the almost collector's gardens, which were full of exotic species. And Darwin particularly would have played around with these different plants that turned up, uh, you know, for example, the Venus flytrap, um, you know, and he they would have informed his scientific discoveries. So do you think it would be fair to say that the gardens of the time did contribute to scientific kind of moves forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they, they, they certainly would have contributed um enormously and if we take you know Darwin's case if you read his books or his notebooks you know one of the kind of interesting features of them is that they do intermingle the kind of ordinary plants of the sort of English garden beans and cabbages and sort of dandelions and so on with um you know sensitive plants and kind of you know orange trees and so on so we get that mixture of the kind of far-flung um and the domestic um informing his research and I also wonder, um, you know, if there is something about that close up sort of attentive botanical perspective um, that might have informed Darwin's broader sort of approaches to science. So that kind of very focused attention on small material details um, rather than the sort of broader horizons of the landscape garden. So in my book, I kind of, you know, explore that and I sort of, um, you know, I kind of consider whether that might have sort of shaped his methodological approaches more broadly um, and his way of doing research that he carried through to Down House in, in his maturity. Yeah, you do have to wonder, like you say, about being up close. He obviously spent time in the garden, studied things that were in it and, and you know, drew knowledge from those. Uh, and they obviously, it sparked a curiosity as well that led him off down lots and lots of different avenues. Um, it was interesting what you were saying about his sisters because and his mother, um, particularly his sisters seemed like they were the kind of glue that kept the house together uh, from a domestic sense and also probably a lot of a lot to do with keeping the garden going. And whilst Darwin was on the Beagle, um, the correspondence between him and his family seems to have been set against this backdrop of seasonal events that were happening in the garden in England. Um, and I wondered if that was merely a common topic of conversation or were those updates of kind of a deeper significance to him as he was traveling around the world yeah so um there's this beautiful set of letters that darwin exchanges um between um 
uh, his sisters, so Caroline, Catherine and Susan, while he was on the Beagle. Um, so they wrote to him regularly from their home at the Mount. And one of the really interesting things about those letters, which are um, in Cambridge now, at Cambridge University, is that they do often share gardening news. Um, so details about the changing of the seasons. They talk about the emergence of spring flowers, a young cuckoo being taken in, um, the orchard being in full blow. They talk about a banana plant and a palm that they've been growing um, in the hothouse that their father's been involved in growing. So there's this whole discussion that kind of centres around the garden while Darwin is on the Beagle. Um, and I think that's really interesting. I think it is more than just um, sort of conversational um, because the details that they include often are have a sort of seasonal element to them. And I think this sort of complements other ways that the sisters had of marking a sort of shared sense of the passing of time. Um, so, for instance, the sisters, they always write on, they take turns in writing on the first Tuesday of every month. So there's something about sending these letters and sharing these new, uh, these um, sort of details about the garden that I think was important as a way of kind of bringing Darwin back home sort of imaginatively if not sort of literally they did want to bring him back home literally as well but they also try and kind of bring him back into the kind of shared imagined space of the garden um, and the time frames of the garden the sort of organic rhythms of the garden um, that they all kind of enjoyed and, and kind of would have known together um, since childhood so they're really fascinating um letters and they're really preoccupied with, with both gardening and the passing of time and different ways of marking the passing of time yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? As a, as a thought, it, it almost kind of grounded him, um, it, you know, regardless of what time zone he was in, uh, he had a link back to the house and the garden and the family. Um, you mentioned, obviously, the family, but but you also spoke about the gardeners. Um, and I wondered what role did they play in shaping the garden and also Darwin's work? <laughs> Yeah, so um, there's three gardeners who I kind of talk about in my book. I've got a chapter which is just focused on the gardeners. Um, so the gardeners that I talk about are called Joseph Phipps, John Abbey, and George Wynne. Um, and it was really important for me to kind of find a way of writing them into this book um, because, as I said, I didn't really want the book to be a sort of elite history, which is just about elite figures. Um, and I wanted to tell the communal story of the garden and think about some of the ways in which all of the people who've been connected to it um, have sort of influenced Darwin's work through it. Um, so obviously these gardeners aren't famous, you know, they're not like the Darwins or the Wedgwoods um, and it involved kind of digging around in kind of census records um, and in kind of notebooks and um, sort of uh, some of some of Darwin's own writings to kind of find out a little bit more about the, the lives of these men and the role that they did play um, at the Mount. And I think, as I see it, they had two sort of key contributions, and one was just to do with providing labour. And I think labour is quite often written out of garden histories, more conventional garden histories, or perhaps it isn't always as fully acknowledged as, as it as I feel it should be. So I wanted to write that into my history of the Mount Garden. Um, so the gardeners were well paid and they had, you know, good jobs at the Mount and they were well respected, um, you know, and the family were very fond of them, but they were, you know, they were kind of referred to as, as servants, at least in their earliest careers. And I think a lot of the work that they did would have been quite hard and physical and demanding. So things like digging and cleaning and chopping and, you know, mending fences, maybe collecting ice from the river for the ice house. All of that work um, is going on there in the background and enabling, um, you know, the more kind of uh, glamorous and exciting sort of experimenting with exotics and so on. So there's all of that. Um, but then because of their links to Darwin, obviously the garden has also had these really interesting opportunities to contribute to scientific experiments that were undertaken at the Mount. Um, so there's a little period of time when Darwin's back from the Beagle um, before he moves to Down House. Um, so in the late 1830s and the early 1840s, when Darwin does do some botanical experiments um, at the Mount House. And one of the gardeners who is quite interesting here, the sort of key figure is John Abberley, who was the gardener there at that point. He was about the same age as Darwin, and he probably um, knew him from boyhood 
because his father had also worked um, as a kind of labourer slash gardener um, at a previous date. So one of his letters survives, um, just one that I found, um, and it's an account of Abelie's role in an experiment about pollination um, in cucumbers and peas and beans and thyme. So he's trying to work out how cucumbers are pollinated and he's describing and counting seeds and Darwin has sort of set him this task um, and he's he's recording um, you know what he has noted. So it's a really interesting letter because um, it suggests on the one hand that you know Abelie didn't have a formal education, there's lots of misspellings, um, but on the other hand we get the sense that he is you know, he's intelligent, he's observant, he's committed, he's quite able to undertake this task um, that Darwin has kind of asked him to do. And another really interesting thing about Abelie, as well as that he kept bees at the mount, um, so, you know, that was quite common at the time. Um, and in Darwin's notebooks, in his questions and experiments notebook, um, Darwin talks about, you know, asking Abelie for information on bees, you know, he's going to ask Abelie to tell him more about some vicious types of bees and so on. So this is really interesting, um, I think, and it's something that I talk about in my book, because Darwin's first piece on reproductive botany was about bees. Um, it was called humblebees, which is the Victorian term for bumblebees. Um, and he published it in the Gardener's Chronicle, which was one of his um, favourite magazines. And it's all about how bees... Um, they kind of bite into plants to uh, get the nectar without pollinating them. So they have this special trick for sort of hacking, um, hacking plants and getting the nectar without having to go through that usual process of pollination. Um, and this research, it, it kind of it goes into humblebees and then it goes on into as well into on the origin of species. So uh, Darwin sort of recycles that and incorporates that into on the origin of species. So it's really kind of interesting, I think, that there is this thread that goes from Abelie, his work on bees, and Darwin talking to Abelie about his work on bees, all the way through to <clears throat> On the Origin of Species. Um, and my book just kind of leans into that a little bit imaginatively, um, and I use it to talk about, uh, you know, Darwin's collaborative research methods, and maybe as well the kind of relationship between sort of vernacular everyday gardening practices, the kind of stuff that Abelie did, and the development um, of, you know, Darwin's theories and kind of more formal uh, botanical uh, scientific knowledge. Yeah, and you do give us tantalising glimpses throughout the book of the original source material, such as, I don't know, correspondence and, and notebook entries, for example. Um, you will have filtered through all of that. You mentioned going to various places to see these texts. Um, do you get the sense that Darwin did genuinely love his garden or was it just a laboratory for him? <clears throat> yeah, um, that's an interesting question. So I think that, um, you know, the Mount was never really a laboratory for Darwin. I think Down House sort of was in Kent, um, you know, when he's a mature man and he lives there um, from the 1840s onwards. And it's there that he does, um, you know, uh, many experiments in the garden which feed into on the origin of species so the mount's a little bit different he did do some experiments there we know um so the ones um that i just mentioned in the early 1840s some botanical experiments there and then as a child as well he did kind of boyhood experiments there so some of his very first kind of playful experiments were done at the mount um you know, when he talks about being able to colour crocuses as he likes or when he talks about collecting stones or collecting birds' eggs. So all of those kinds of, you know, naturalist sensibilities that are developed at the Mount. Um, but I think, you know, that Darwin definitely had an emotional um, connection to the Mount um, that's maybe more important even than the kind of um, experimental work that he did do there. So he talks about the garden a lot when he's on the Beagle voyage. Um, when he comes to the end of that voyage, he writes um, to one of his sisters to say that he's seen nothing like the view from the back of the house um, in all of the kind of outlandish places that he's travelled to. And he kind of fantasises about seeing the garden trees again, talking about a copper beach and an acacia there. And then he writes about the garden a lot um, at the start of both of his autobiographical works. So one that he wrote in 1838, an autobiographical fragment 
and also a, a longer mature work that he did um, in the 1870s. And in that book, um, he depicts himself as a child gardener, you know, a boy collecting pebbles and fishing in the river, um, stealing fruit um, from the kitchen garden. So there's this sense, I think, that the garden at the Mount is quite important to the way Darwin feels about himself um, and his own kind of development. You know, it's his first playground. It's the place where he first roamed and explored um, the natural world with his sisters. And then if we think about Down House as well, um, when I visited Down House, I was struck by the, the way it is quite similar to Mount House. You know, it, it looks like a similar building and it has this, this big garden um, that upstages the house. And I have the feeling, although I don't, you know, I don't have evidence exactly that the Mount was at the back of Darwin's mind when he purchased Down. You know, he liked that place. He was seeking to... Uh, revive kind of aspects of it that he enjoyed and to sort of carry them forward um, with him into his maturity. Yeah, there's a, a botanical explorer and artist called Mary, Marianne North. I don't know if you've come across her work, but she um, travelled the world documenting the most incredible landscapes and species, uh, you know, that were just unheard of at the time. And she still said that Actually, for her, the perfect landscape was, I think it was primroses she particularly mentioned, but just that perfect landscape was was at home. Uh, so it's really interesting that, that gardens and landscapes become anchors for people who have travelled and it's, it's kind of what they yearn for um, and what they what they love the most and value the most. Um, so thinking back, kind of bring it completely back to the present day, what is the condition of the garden now? Yeah, you mentioned the badgers, obviously. But. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the badgers are kind of new development. My, my, I don't live in Shrewsbury anymore, unfortunately, um, but my sister's been sending me pictures of the kind of, you know, the badgers have taken over the, the kind of bank and it's all been kind of fenced to kind of help with the, the foundations of local houses. So that's a kind of ongoing story. Um, but more generally, um, obviously, the garden, you know, it's not intact. It's not complete. Um, it's not like down the house. It exists in fragments um, and in the mind's eye. So it's something you have to sort of imaginatively reconstruct to understand. So there's the two acres which are owned by Shropshire Wildlife Trust um, and they're on a very steep riverbank um, and they're really overgrown. You know, they're kept for wildlife, which, in you know, makes a lot of sense. You know, it's probably what Darwin would have wanted. It was his main interest after all. Um, up there as well, there's an ice house. So you can see, um, if, you, if you do go into these two acres, you can see the ice house, the ruins of the ice house that used to belong to the Darwins and there's also a pathway up there um, where Darwin used to walk up and down um, with his father taking sort of constitutional strolls um, and some people have said that this is the forerunner of the more kind of famous um, thinking path um, at Down House. And then all around the neighbourhood, there are these, um, you know, there are these kind of surviving fragments. So in somebody's back garden um, that I visited to, um, you know, to kind of write about, there are the kind of remains of the old vinery so all of these stones and parts of the original structure just standing at the end of their garden and then there's the original kitchen garden walls and then of course there's the mount house itself so around the mount house which until recently was used as kind of office buildings there is a large part of a, a more formal um lawn that still survives intact um so there's all of this there's all of these pieces um around the neighborhood and it's all it's all there kind of just under the surface, I suppose, of contemporary developments. And it kind of pops up um, in different um, places. It's quite evocative, um, but it's also quite challenging. It's sort of difficult to kind of try and put that back together. And you have to be a little bit of a detective to try and work out, um, you know, what it would have been like um, back in the 1800s. Yeah, the potential for that site is is interesting. And you talk about that further in the book. And it is really, it's a really interesting story. Um so I urge people to go and read the book um, immediately. But before uh, my final question is, um, it's you talk about, well, the book is called The Ghost in the Garden and there seems to be a recurring cast of characters in the book. And I just wondered if I could ask who was the ghost in the garden? Or whose ghost was it? Yeah, it's. I mean, that's a really good question. So um, the phrase about the ghost in the garden, it's taken from one of Darwin's letters to his sister Caroline um, when he was on the Beagle. So in this letter, Darwin imagines himself um, coming back to the mount and appearing like a ghost is what he says, um, to see his sisters working among the flowers. So I took that um, phrase and used it as my title because... 
it kind of really resonated with me because the whole book is about trying to bring lost people and places back to life so it's full of various hauntings really um, and lots of different ghosts so there's obviously Darwin himself um, I write a lot about Darwin and um, it's quite easy to imagine Darwin as a kind of boy naturalist amongst the greenery um, down by the river or fishing on the banks of the river and parts of my book do kind of lean into that um, and explore that resonance um, but then there's lots of other people as well connected to the site who come into my book as well and some of them have faded out of history you know almost completely or are not very well known about um so the Susanna Darwin Darwin's mother who's really fascinating who I write about in my second chapter she bred doves there um in the early 1800s um with her husband and she was a keen gardener um and Darwin's sisters as well they were once these really vibrant um quite larger than life characters in some in some cases and now they're kind of largely forgotten so you know part of the purpose of my book is kind of breathing some life into these people and bringing them back um into the history of this site and exploring how they sort of shape darwin's uh life and his work as well um so all of these people the gardeners as well who i've also talked about they're all at different turns the sort of ghost in the garden um and the idea of the ghost in general is a way of me kind of thinking about you know lost history forgotten people um and lost childhoods as well the idea of lost childhoods sort of come into the book so all of that is kind of tied up in the figure of the ghost and the hair yeah and the hair. yeah there's a hair as well yeah yeah there's a um a, a really beautiful story um it gets told about darwin by one of his sons uh francis um which is about how he once killed a hair um in the flower garden at shrewsbury um by throwing a marble at it which is an extraordinary detail isn't it um and that's such a beautiful story and such an intriguing story i kind of use it to think about um a sort of shift maybe in Darwin where he kind of moves from being you know the person who went on the voyage of the beagle and who kind of killed and shot animals and there's a kind of shift I think in Darwin towards a, a kind of deeper interest in the life of plants and soil um, and the development maybe of a kind of deeper ecological perspective that's also in on the origin but which I think comes to the fore a little bit you know in his later life um so when he's no longer the boy he sort of killed the hair but um a, a more kind of a settled and sort of reflective figure many thanks to jude for taking part in the interview and sharing some deeper insights into her book and its creation this fate of charles darwin's childhood garden throws up some really interesting thoughts about the life of a garden as it relates to the landscape and to its creators This was also a theme I started to reflect on after interviewing James Golden a few weeks back, and what he says at the end of the interview about what he thinks will happen to his garden. Those who signed up to the Patreon can take part in a discussion around this theme, and as a result, I'll be producing a blog post about the life and fate of a garden, based on the collective thoughts of the Patreon subscribers. I'm aiming to run these discussions on a monthly basis, and to produce a piece of work after each one, so keep an eye on the website if you're interested in the findings, or check out the Patreon link in the show notes if you're interested in becoming involved and contributing to the research. Thank you for listening as always. I'll leave you now with Dr Ian Bedford talking about one species of bug that can catch us by surprise as they go droning past in the darkest months. Winter's now well and truly here, and spending time working in our gardens can sometimes seem a bit of a chore, especially on those cold, damp and miserable days. But when there's a few winter flowering plants to see, we'll be reassured that our gardens are still alive, and that before too long, it'll be springtime, when the beds and the borders will be bursting with fresh new growth. Those winter flowering plants can also remind us that spring won't just signal the start of a new growing season, but the return of insect life, and in particular, the buzz and hum of the bees, since, as surprising as it might seem, During those bleak winter days, worker bumblebees might occasionally be visiting the winter flowers. Surprising, because in the life of a bumblebee colony, the founder queen, all her worker bees and the males would be expected to have died before the onset of winter, leaving only the new queens in a dormant state of hibernation until spring. However, One of our most common bumblebee species, 
the buff-tailed, is a little different from the rest, in that it nests underground, maybe in a deserted mouse hole, or within a compost heap, where the bees are insulated from the cold, and where the colony can generate enough heat to remain active and survive during winter, enabling the worker bees to go out and search for pollen and nectar even during the coldest days when snow lay on the ground. Leaving their warm nests to forage, though, is not without risk, since the longer the bees are out searching, the more energy they'll expend, and the more likely they'll become weak and succumb to the cold. However, we could always try and make life a little bit easier for the buff-tailed bumblebees by adding more winter-flowering plants to our gardens, which should then shorten the foraging trips and increase the odds of the workers returning safely back to their nests for a little bit longer each winter. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.